Hi, it's Mr. Y, the social studies guy, with the premiere episode of Ohio's 88 counties. A little background, I taught in Ohio's public schools social studies for 38 years. My favorite class I taught was seventh grade Ohio history. And I should mention that when I was a student, that was my favorite class also. So thanks to Mr. Evans at Paul C. Bunn Elementary School in Youngstown, Ohio, which is in Mahoney County. In this series, we're gonna take you through Ohio's 88 counties. We're gonna find that we're gonna see all this different interesting facts about each county. We're gonna visit a lot of different places and I think you're really gonna enjoy this series. As we travel around, we will be starting out with the county seats and every county seat has a courthouse. And behind me is the courthouse for Sandusky County, the first county we're gonna do in this particular series. Now, this courthouse has a very interesting history. It's the only courthouse in Ohio that's actually built on top of a dungeon. What happened was the old wooden jail was not secure enough for the prisoners that they had. So they built 12 dungeon-like cells and they built the courthouse on top of it. Now we think of the Middle Ages with dungeons as having all kinds of torture devices and really terrible places. Well, well, there was none of that, but there was no light. It was almost what we call today about in prison being in the hole. So it was really not a real humane thing, but it did prevent any prisoners from escaping. Now, you can still see those today when they do have some infrequent tours on the north side of the building is where those are located. Also on the top floor of the courthouse is a gallows. Now gallows were used for hanging. Now as we know during the time of the Wild West, we always think about people getting to have their self if they were in a crime, they would hang up for horse thieving or cattle rustling. Well, they did that here also. It didn't last very long, thank goodness, but they did keep the gallows, which again can be seen during some of the tours along the way. So is it a scary place? No and that you're going to pay your taxes. It's kind of scary then. But one of the cool things about this courthouse is up on the second floor, there's a lot of pictures of individuals that have been honored as Liberty Bell Award winners by the Sandusky County Bar Association. That's a group of attorneys that practice here along the way. And it happens every year they pick a person who has done the most to promote citizenship in Sandusky County. And I'm very fortunate to say my picture is up there also. So these lawyers are actually pretty smart people, which is a really good thing because one of the lawyers we're gonna hear about a lot that first started practicing right here in Fremont was our 19th president, Rutherford B. Hayes. We're gonna hear a lot about him as we go through this particular series along the way. How did Sandusky County get its name? Well, you're looking at it right now. The Sandusky River. Now for the Hurons and the Wyandots, they pronounce it a little differently. It was a say Undoski, but we pronounce it Sandusky. It has been the source of confusion over a number of years when it came to the place name of Fremont, Ohio, which we're going to talk about here in just a second. This river flows in the Sandusky Bay and eventually into Lake Erie. As you can see, it's down a little bit right now, but it is a river which has a great historic importance, in particular when we talk about the Battle of Fort Stevenson with the British boats coming down the Sandusky River. Now, what happened was the source of this river is in Crestline, Ohio, which is down in Crawford County. And there was a gentleman in Delaware, Ohio, who was a businessman, a trader who traded a lot with the Indians, was very good friends with them, who would sail down the Sandusky River. It turned out he really enjoyed this particular area, as we're going to see in a little bit why. But what happened was he went back to Delaware and his nephew was studying to be an attorney. Now this gentleman was Sardis Birchard. Now we hear Birchard Library, we hear the word Birchard quite a bit in Sandusky County. But Sardis Birchard convinced his nephew, Rutherford B. Hayes, to come up to this area which at the time was known as Lower Sandusky. Now, there was a lot of confusion because you have the city of Sandusky in Erie County, you have Upper Sandusky in Wyandotte County, so now we have Lower Sandusky. So what happened was, 
Hayes as an attorney proposed that they change the name of Lower Sandusky to Fremont to honor John C. Fremont, the noted explorer of the West and probably the most famous cartographer or map maker in the history of the United States. So what happened was, in his first case before the Sandusky County Bar, Hayes brings the petition to bring the name of Fremont instead of Lower Sandusky. Everybody was in agreement that it would make it a lot easier. So that's how Fremont got its name. Okay. So the river, the river that starts the Sandusky County is a, what it's all named about. Brought a lot of famous people to this area. It was used a lot by the settlers, was used by the Native Americans, and it means cold water. We are here at what's probably the most famous spot in Sandusky County history. At this very spot was Fort Stevenson, one of the most famous battles in the War of 1812. The story behind Fort Stevenson was extremely interesting because the fort was commanded by a 21-year-old, George C. Krogan, and he was a commander that had great respect from his men. What happened was, during the defense of the fort, General Proctor, the British general from Detroit, came down along with Tecumseh, and he had many of his Indians. In fact, they estimated that there was over 1,200 between British and Indians that came down the Sandusky River and came here to this spot to attack this fort. Now, the commanding officer of the United States Army at that time, General William Henry Harrison, had sent a message to General Krogan saying, desert the fort, burn it down, you're, you're outnumbered, and just get out of there, basically. Well, what happened was that Major Krogan, again, he's 21 years old, disregards that, sends actually a note by courier back to General Harrison and says, it's too late, we're going to defend the fort and defend the fort is what they did, particularly with the help of this most famous piece of artillery, probably in United States history, this lone cannon called Old Betsy. You can see what happened was, Krogan, knowing they were greatly outnumbered, only had one cannon for the whole fort. His men had rifles, but he only had 160 men. So they were greatly outnumbered by the British troops and by the Indians under, once again, Tecumseh. So Krogan, got his men together and said, we can do this, but we have to have a strategy that shows them that we have a lot more cannon than we actually have. He they only had one, and that was Betsy. So what they did was, after every shot, they would rotate the, the cannon, bring it to the next opening of the fort, and then bring it to the next one. Well, you can imagine, old Betsy got pretty hot during the course of that time, but it was a strategy that he felt was the only strategy that would work. Again, they were greatly outnumbered. So what happened was the British had their gunboats. You can't see the river from here with all the building that's happened over the course of history. But the river's down there. The gunboats are there. They're firing from the gunboats, but not enough to reach the fort. They bring out artillery from the gunboats, but not enough to reach the fort. And Proctor, forgot something. He thought, you know, again, they would go with the land assault and then take ladders and scale up the fort, but they forgot ladders, which was a wonderful thing for the soldiers of Fort Stevenson. But again, what happens is Krogan decides that they need to make a major impression on these invading forces. And he tells his men, load up Betsy with everything you can find, besides the gunpowder, put in scrap metal, put in nails, put in old gun parts, put in anything you can. So they do that. Now he waits until the British troops are almost close to the uh, fort, 20, 30 yards away, fairly close. And I'm sure the British at this time are wondering why they're not firing. Well, when they do, remember, it's loaded up with all these different materials besides gunpowder. So when they do, the carnage is just unbelievable for the British and the Indians that are there. They estimate with the first cannon shot that 150 British troops were killed with the first one. Then there was wounded, there was maimed, 
and according to the eyewitness accounts, everybody was screaming in pain. Proctor, though, was determined his strategy would work. Remember, they were moving old Betsy around to different spots. So Proctor sends in a second wave. Again, they load up old Betsy with the same, everything they could find. Again, it works. And Proctor finally sends a third wave. Well, by this time, there is so much carnage on the battlefield that a lot of the British soldiers desert, run away. The Native Americans, they leave. Tecumseh, after the first one, had seen enough to know he was upset with Proctor the way Proctor was actually doing the battle. So he left on a boat, going back up the Sandusky River. So what happens is, at night, the Indians come, they drag the wounded back, and Proctor decides to call off the invasion, and Fort Stevenson is saved. And then, when he gets word, General Kroger, to where Henry Harrison was has signing papers that court-martial him, Harrison instead declares him a hero for saving this fort. This is a really wonderful piece of history when you think about the fact that they were so greatly outnumbered, a commander who was very young, and yet they were able to pull off this wonderful, it was actually one of the biggest and most important battles of the War of 1812 because we were not doing very well up until this time. This was a great morale booster to our country fighting against the British in this war. And what happens is that it really made Krogan a national hero. He goes on to get appointed, believe it or not, from this post as being the postmaster general of the city of New Orleans in Louisiana. But he does end up fighting in several other military campaigns. Unfortunately, he dies at a pretty young age of 57 from cholera, which was pretty common down in that area around New Orleans in the southern part of our country. But again, He's interred here, right here, at this monument. Uh, his remains were brought from the Krogan Family Cemetery in Kentucky. They were brought back here to Fremont for this wonderful monument that honors him, honors the man. And again, old Betsy is here. Hard to believe that one cannon could be used to save an entire fort. And by the way, we are actually on the grounds of the Birchard Public Library. And this library has an interesting history also because we mentioned already about President Hayes. Well, his uncle, Sardis Birchard, actually was the one who was the founder of this library. And President Hayes was the first president of the Board of Trustees for the Birchard Public Library. Now, I was secretary of the Board of Trustees, so I have a little bit in common with President Hayes, but I love this story. I think it's a great story, and I hope you enjoy it. We're here in front of the Hayes Presidential Museum and Presidential Library. This was the first presidential library in the United States in honor of President Hayes. Many scholars use this. They were studying that particular era of history in the Hayes presidency. Uh, the museum is very fascinating. We used to bring school tours here when I was teaching Ohio history, and it was wonderful for the kids to actually see the exhibits about President Hayes at that particular era of American history. These grounds here are known as Spiegel Grove. This was an area that, remember we talked about at the river, about Sardis Birchard coming down the river, trading with the Indians, and what happened was he found this particular area, and this area had a lot of beauty to it, as it still does today, as you can see, but they had reflecting pools. And in German, the word Spiegel is the word for mirror, which these reflecting pools were like mirrors. And Sardis Birchard bought this territory. He was one of the biggest landowners, by the way, in this whole particular area of Ohio. He owned land in actually six different counties. But he wanted to build a house here for himself and for President Hayes. Of course, he didn't get to see him be president, but he did get to see him accomplish a lot in his life. And fortunately, when he had the house built, he only lived for a year in the house with President Hayes and his family. He was not able to see President Hayes get inaugurated as president, which I'm sure was something that really disappointed him. Uh, but this particular Spiegel Grove 
is used by so many people and they get so many tourists that come here that are interested in history. We're outside the Hayes Presidential Home, which once again was built by his uncle, Sardis Burchard. Sardis Burchard had a plan that, again, he was a lifelong bachelor, did not have any children of his own. Hayes was his nephew, but basically like an adopted son. And what happened was when he built this house, um, because of Hayes, again, being governor of Ohio, uh, all the political things, it didn't work for him to move up here. But a couple of his children did move up for a while and stayed with Uncle Sarvisher. So they knew the grounds, they, they knew the house. And the fact is that many historians figure that this is, of all the houses that presidents lived in, in our country, this is probably the most authentic because it was always owned by a member of the Hayes family until it was turned over to the state of Ohio for the historical society. So the tours that they take you through here are well worth your time and effort to go through them. The people here that serve as guides do an absolutely wonderful job. The house is a very well preserved. Uh, they tell a great story of how Hayes enjoyed this particular area. For example, what happens is when Sardis Bircher built the house, he had a very small porch on the front, but President Hayes, who loved to walk, wanted a big, long porch, okay, so he could survey the grounds, but he also got all of his walking in right there on his porch along the way. Uh, you find a lot of interesting uh, tidbits from the guides into the life of President Hayes and his family. Uh, we all know his wife, whose nickname was Lemonade Lucy because, again, not serving alcohol at the functions that they had. But you find out a lot about the children, a very interesting history. And I would certainly encourage you to visit the Hayes Home and the Hayes Museum when you're here going through Fremont in Sandusky County. As we continue talking about Sandusky County, we are now in the city of Clyde, Ohio. You might hear some truck traffic going by. Clyde, Ohio is located on Route 20. Very interesting history that this was once Route 20, a corduroy road. That's because the roads were so muddy as the forests were cleared in what is now black swamp territory that they split these huge logs, these tree trunks, and they made this road so the stagecoaches that were traveling, going from, for example, Lorraine and places to going to Maumee on these different corduroy roads, they would stop at these various taverns along the way so the travelers could relax. Across the street we're at right now was called Hamer's Tavern, and they had a meeting once to decide what they were going to call this community. And one of the travelers said, why don't you call it Clyde? He says, I'm from Clyde, New York. So that's how Clyde got its name, named after Clyde, New York. Now, Clyde has a very interesting history from some very famous individuals. So what happens is there's signs that you'll see that say Clyde, America's famous small town. One of the reasons, particularly for historians, is right behind me in this statue of General James Birdseye McPherson. General McPherson, his house is right across the street from this cemetery, McPherson Cemetery, which was named originally Evergreen Cemetery, named in honor of General McPherson, as we're going to find out. But his house he grew up in is right across the street from this cemetery and is now part of the Clyde Museum complex. But General McPherson was a person who seemed to be born for greatness. Uh, as a young man, he was very exceptional in school. He was a worker at a store in Green Springs, which was fairly close to Clyde. He'd go over there and work after school and during the summers, on the weekends, very industrious, and earned an appointment to West Point, where he graduated with honors at West Point. Very well-known soldier. And what happens is, as the Civil War progresses, he ends up being on the staff of General Ulysses S. Grant. He's is an engineer. And he works his way up to where he becomes a general. Now, again, during the Civil War, it was not easy for anyone who was in battle. And John McPherson was killed during the Battle of Atlanta. 
And it was really a, a sad thing, not just for the Union, but actually for the South, that the opposing general in that battle of Atlanta was John Bell Hood, who was a classmate of General McPherson's at West Point. He wrote a very heartfelt letter about how sorry he was that the North had lost one of their greatest soldiers. So it's important to note that he was so well respected that even today in these alternative history series books, one of them, which is labeled, What If the South Had Won the Civil War, theorizes that in that book that McPherson actually survived the shooting and goes on to become president of the United States for two terms and reconciles the Confederate states with the northern states. Now, it's really interesting at our Clyde Museum right here in Clyde that there's a book called Forgotten Hero, which details John McPherson's life. It's well worth a read and well worth visiting that museum also to find out more about General McPherson. This statue was dedicated in 1881. At that time, President Hayes, once again, we talked about a lot earlier in the video from Fremont, was the person who was the main speaker. There was a lot of notary, no, notable citizens and people such as General William Tecumseh Sherman were here, other army officers, notable figures from Washington, D.C. It was the biggest event in Clyde history, which took place right here where we're standing at right now. So General James Birdseye McPherson, military hero from Clyde, Ohio. Right now we're on the Evergreen Drive section of McPherson Cemetery. Once again, that was known as Evergreen Cemetery where Joe McPherson grew up across the street at the house. Of course, now named after him, McPherson Cemetery. But he's not the only person of notable military history who's buried in this cemetery. If we look at it, of course, number one is James B. McPherson, the highest ranking Union officer to die in the Civil War, though some historians say he's the second highest. But we're going to say for sake of what our sign says, what everybody in Clyde says, he was the highest, okay? Number two, the McPherson family graves. Three, Jacob Daggett died 1836, Revolutionary War veteran. Four, and then we're going to talk about this a little bit later, Emma Anderson, who was the mother of Arthur Sherwood Anderson, also from Clyde. We're going to, again, talk about that. Number five, Captain Charles H. McCleary died in 1906, Civil War veteran, Medal of Honor winner. Okay, six, the 1776 tree. If you can imagine that, 1776 tree. Number seven, with a very interesting statue here in the cemetery, George Burton Meek died May 11th, 1898, first American killed in the Spanish-American War. And then number eight, okay, which is something we're gonna really focus on here in just a bit. Private Roger W. Young died July 31st, 1943, World War II Medal of Honor recipient. And he has a very interesting story, which I think you're gonna enjoy hearing about. We are standing at the gravesite of World War II hero, Private Roger Young. No relation, by the way, but I'm very proud of him, as so many people are in this area, not just in Clyde, but in Green Springs and Tiffin. Roger Young was born in Tiffin, Ohio, and they moved to this area. And he was uh, very interesting because this was a guy who had a huge, huge heart. Uh, he wanted to play football in school, but he was pretty slight. He was not very tall whatsoever, was not, didn't weigh very much, and the football coach said, uh, we really don't have any use for you. But he practiced and practiced and practiced and wasn't just a tackling dummy, but he practiced hard and finally he was able to get into a few games. Then he decided, even as short as he was, they wanted to play basketball for the school. And what happened was he had a very violent collision with one of his opponents. And because of that, he ended up basically having terrible eyesight and loss of hearing. This greatly affected him throughout most of his life, obviously, as both of those progressively as the years went on got worse and worse. Now, we were looking at the advent of World War II in our country, and Roger Young knew that his conditions would probably keep him out of the Army. 
So he joined the Ohio National Guard. But after the bombing of Pearl Harbor and our entrance into the war, the National Guard was called into duty because we needed as many soldiers as possible. So what happens is that Roger Young is sent to the Pacific Theater to fight. And in that area, the Japanese held many strongholds. Now you probably hear we're in the Christian Cemetery, so we got lawnmowers going on, we got all kinds of things going on, okay, today. But we're still telling you this great story about Private Roger W. Young and why he's so interesting to know about. So anyway, what happens is Roger Young sent over there and his platoon is ordered to take out a Japanese machine gun nest. Now, again, I, I mentioned that he was very small, very wiry, but he was very brave. Now, because his hearing had gotten so bad, his eyesight had gotten so bad, he had actually achieved the rank of corporal, but he had asked to the commander to go back to being a private. He did not want the responsibility for all the men because he was afraid something might happen to him. So what happens is that, and you know what, there might even be for some of you so, some interesting things about if you ever seen the Captain America series, okay, that Captain America, as you remember, that Steve Rogers is this very small guy and he shows a tremendous amount of bravery. And that shows that exactly it doesn't really matter it matters where your heart's at. That's what Roger Young's heart is at. So anyway, him and his platoon advance up this hill, okay, the island of New Georgia, in this battle, and he's, he's shot, okay, and he's shot. But around him, two men are killed right around him. And he's really concerned for the safety of the rest of his platoon members. So he keeps crawling up this hill. The Japanese are entranced in this, this machine gun nest. They're shooting it up the whole time. He continues crawling up the hill, okay? Even members of his platoon are, are telling him, no, don't do this, okay? He continues. Now, maybe he didn't hear them, but I like to think it was because of the heart that he wanted to save the rest of the platoon. And he's shot again, and he still continues climbing, and he gets out of the grenade, throws in the machine gun nest, and kills the Japanese soldiers, and saves the rest of his platoon. Now this story was so impressive that it actually led not only to him getting the highest honor, the Medal of Honor, but they actually wrote a song, The Ballad of Roger Young, which became very, very popular. It was sung by people like Burl Ives, a great folk singer, and it was on TV uh, during the Jack Benny show that people sang this song, The Ballad of Roger Young. So again, here is a World War II hero that a lot of people got to hear about because of this very famous song. We're here right now at the uh, actual Crown Jewel at Clyde, the Clyde Museum. Now, if you get a chance to visit Clyde, this is really a wonderful place to go through to get a feel for the community and some of the famous people that have grown up here in Clyde, some we've talked about already with a lot of different displays. But one we haven't alluded to are on the fact that his mother, Emma Anderson, being buried in McPherson Cemetery, is Sherwood Anderson, the author. Now, Sherwood Anderson, mainly known for the book Winesburg, Ohio, which is shown here in this display all about him and his family, okay? And this book, actually a collection of 22 short stories, okay, is so well regarded in American fiction that Modern Library ranked it as 24th out of the greatest 100 fiction books by American authors. Now, Sherwood Anderson grew up here in Clyde as a young boy. Um, he didn't stick around that long. When he was 18, he moved away. But he lived a life that was actually pretty sad and lonely while he was here. And he took a lot of his reflections of growing up here. And a lot of people say that was what this whole book is about, is Clyde, Ohio. But yet Anderson himself said that a lot of the book was taken from stories of the people his fellow roommates in a boarding house in Chicago he lived in. But yet, the whole idea of Winesburg, Ohio, which Clyde was never known as Winesburg, okay? Winesburg, Ohio is a very small Amish community in Holmes County. And 
we don't know how the Amish feel about the book because the book was very sensational when it was published due to some of the material there, which was actually pretty racy for the times. But in his book, they actually have a street map that shows some of the ta town streets right here in Clyde, Ohio. And a lot of the references were seemed to a lot of the residents here at the time, oh yeah, that's about this person, or that's about that person, or this person. So there was that controversy about where it was actually based upon itself. But Anderson himself, his, his work is, is so well respected, particularly in Japan of all places, that a lot of people that are into the literary world come here to this museum to find out more and study more about Sherwood Anderson and his works. So we have this whole display here of Sherwood Anderson, and there's another over here display of his brother, the artist, Carl Anderson. So you see some of the works here that his brother, Carl Anderson, did. So this family was very much into the arts between writing and painting. So Emma Anderson, who we talked about earlier, really must have instilled that love of the arts into her children. So again, I would highly recommend a visit to the Clyde Museum. I know you'd enjoy it. I know you'd learn a lot. I hope you've enjoyed us talking about scenic and historical Sandusky County. We're going to be talking a little bit more about some other communities. Uh, Green Springs, which is half in Sandusky, half in Seneca. We're going to really focus on that as we do Seneca County coming up very shortly in our series. We also have Bellevue, which is partly in Sandusky County. We're going to focus a little more on that when we do Huron County. And then we have towns like Woodville and Gibsonburg and Burgoon, all parts of wonderful Sandusky County. So I hope you've enjoyed this series that we're coming about it. Now, for our viewers, you might have some things you'd like to share about Sandusky County also. So please let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much. And one county down, 87 more to go. We do O'Hare's 88 counties with Mr. Y, the social studies guy. <laughs>